welcome. <laughs> um, Deanna and I have met before and we've, we've talked a lot about PJ and what we do in the city and essentially to, you know, just put it in a few words, uh, PJ Library is, um, was created to support parents raising Jewish children. Um, and we've decided to work with JCRC. We decided to come together for this series that we're calling Navigating Judaism to talk about um, with, with families what it's like to be Jewish and in a society that's predominantly not Jewish and how can we, how can we make, it, make it easier for parents and what can we do to help out? Um, so Lindsay, I will, <laughs> I'll turn it back to you and let's, uh, yeah. let you get started. Are we, um, yeah. so we can, I mean, like you're saying, we can just have this as, as a discussion instead of putting up the polls, we can just ask the questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we are recording. So it's possible that future audiences will, you know, I, I might, I might speak a little bit more broadly than is directly applicable to your family, Deanna. Um, but, um, so that it's, so that it's, resonates with future watchers. Um, but I'll just say a little bit of, I'll just add a little bit to the framing. Um, when Robbie and I connected probably over a year ago, we recognized that, um, you know, the anti-Semitism continues to increase and where we are seeing it at the JCRC, and the JCRC is the Jewish community's public policy arm and intergroup relations arm. And we were, we were founded, we, we were established during World War II when the Jewish community recognized that we needed to be proactive in a, in a really um, significant and critical way when it comes to combating anti-Semitism, particularly through the relationship building that we do, whether as a community, as an organization, or as individual Jews um, out in the community at large to talk about um, what it's like to be Jewish. So we have a number of programs, um, some that train teens on how to talk about being Jewish um, or middle schoolers on how to recognize anti-Semitism and stand up and speak out. And, uh, and, and so when, when Robbie and I talked, we said, you know, there's a real opportunity for um, families to feel like they are being proactive as well. And as someone who works in the Jewish community, um, it might come a little bit more naturally to me. And I understand that, but I, so I have kids. I have now a, an eighth grader, sixth grader, and excuse me. <laughs> So I'll introduce myself while Lindsay's going. My name's Margo and I work with Lindsay, at, uh, with Robbie at the Federation um, and Marla and Lindsay through JCRC, but I work for the Jewish Federation. Um, and I also have two kids, an eighth grader like Lindsay, they're in the same school and a high school senior, which is horrifying to think about, but true. That is nuts. She's it is nice, but it's, it's true. <laughs> I was just introducing myself, Lindsay, and saying how I, that this is like our normal. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so, so as a mom with kids in elementary and middle school, and even before, I um, always went into their classrooms and talked about Jewish holidays. Um, and I could see over the years what a difference that made, not only in the school's recognition of Jewish holidays and how to be cognizant of them, but in the teacher's interest um, in learning more, in my kids' sense of pride when they would know that I was coming in to talk about Rosh Hashanah or or um, Hanukkah, and in their ability to sort of talk about being Jewish from an early age and have that pride, and for all of the other students in the classroom. Um, I would joke, you know, my, when they were kindergarten, first and second grade, they were so excited to have me, and then it sort of morphed a little bit. The older they got, they were like, oh, mom's coming in, and by fifth and sixth grade, it was, come on, mom, you know? but I would walk into a classroom and the entire class who had been listening to us talk about these holidays for five or six years knew 
knew everything about Rosh Hashanah, knew everything about Hanukkah, um, and had, a, had learned a little bit of content along the way. Um, and so as Ravi and I were talking, we th thought, you know, this is not something that comes naturally, understandably, to parents who, um, you know, may not feel comfortable doing it, may feel like they have to know everything, may not know if it's allowed. How do I talk about um, a Jewish holiday in a classroom in a way that's appropriate? So, so we wanted to do this, this very thing, and just really in a simple way, walk people through how it could look whether it's preschool, whether it's um, elementary school. Um, can, can, and can I ask a quick question here? Of before? course. Um, <clears throat> because I'm new to the area and, and also new to parenthood, um, uh, I, I'm unfamiliar with like the, you know, the number of Jewish kids in uh, your average school. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm used to being uh, living in more urban environments and urban areas where it's not <laughs> I mean, there, people are aware of you and it's not really a, you know, big deal. So I, I'm just curious, could you describe to me like a nutshell what the Indiana schools are going to be like? I just sure. don't know. Well, um, it, it all depends on your school district. And that's really the quickest answer. There are some school districts where there are more Jewish families, but um, even in um, parts of Washington Township or parts of West Carmel or, or Central Carmel where there might be two or three Jewish kids in a class, that in like a single class, not necessarily the grade. Um, that's probably an average. Maybe there'll be some classrooms where there's four or five, um, but in most situations, a Jewish student might be the only Jewish student in their classroom. Certainly, yeah. um, in you know uh, Pike or IPS or maybe Lawrence or Fishers, you know, I mean, and, and you mm -hmm. would just sort of luck into if there's more than one maybe in a classroom. And Lindsay, um, I can uh, I can speak to the demographic study that sure. the Federation did several years ago. Um, there are about five thousand kids being raised in a Jewish home, at least you know, with one Jewish adult. Um, in, in Indianapolis and surrounding areas, like Carmel, Fischl, Fishers, Geist, you know, these, these places. Um, and we're finding that most of these families are now leaving what we call the core, the north, like the core area around the JCC, the 46260 area code. Um, and they're moving up to Carmel. So you're, you're in Carmel, right, Deanna? We're actually in Westfield right now. Um, we, we are Westfield. waiting to buy a okay. house until the kids are in school and I'm back working full time again. Yeah. Right. So, so, so I mean, the yeah. area, it's growing. It's growing, definitely. That's where most Jews are, are moving is up towards, towards Carmel, Westfield, Fishers, these areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whether, but you know, even if it's a couple Jewish kids or a half a dozen Jewish kids, um, Either way, whether it's one or six, um, I find myself, one of the things that I do in, uh, in my job with JCRC is connect with parents who are navigating a frustrating experience. Um, at best, maybe it's a conflict, uh, a test or a field trip or a sporting event that's being scheduled on um, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. Um, and I get the question, how is this still happening? Well, <laughs> you know, it is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's in many ways incumbent upon us as members of the Jewish community to use our voice. You know, teachers won't know if there's a Jewish student, administrators, principals, you know, they all change. And as we know, the dates change every year. And so one of the first resources that we have that, that if, if nothing else, um, is done for a parent to run off copies or email copies of our seven year calendar. And Marla, hopefully you're able to share your screen and just show a quick visual of what this calendar looks like. JCRC creates, and we have it posted on our website, a calendar that goes seven years out. Now that we're in 2020, it's the next five years and we'll be updating it soon. But if you see on the second page, it gives all the dates, um, not just for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but even dates where um, students who are more observant may be missing. 
Um, it includes Shabbat and it includes the, the, the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. You know, these are the dates most likely that students will be out of school. And for a parent to walk in on the first day of school or walk in at a, at a, conf, a parent teacher conference or email it ahead of time and say, I just wanted you to have this. Um, my student is going to be out of school on these dates, you know, and you can circle them. Um, yes, we will attach a link to the calendar in the chat, and um, which, which is from our website. And you'll be able to just forward it on, download it. And we also have hard copies that we can, hard copies that, by the way, we send out also. Um, so we send these to schools, but whether, <laughs> whether they post them and look at them, you know, that, that is, you know, you can lead a horse to water kind of thing. So for, for a, a parent with, alongside their young children to walk into school and hand this calendar over, and for, you know, if it's a first or second or third grader to say, I'm not gonna be in school on Rosh Hashanah, that's a really empowering thing for the young student to do. It's a great proactive thing for the parent to do, to say, hey, I'm trying, you know, let's, Let's um, look at a calendar now and make sure that if you're planning anything that these days, you know, you, you acknowledge because after it's been planned, after the conflict is there, it's often hard. Um, and a teacher will say, gosh, I just didn't know. Or the school will say, oh, there are so many holidays, you know, if you'd only let us know. So it, that is one huge way. And, and it also tells your kids, this is important and I'm going to be missing school and I'm letting my teacher know well in advance. Um, so first thing any parent can do is to share this seven-year calendar. Um, we've also pulled together a couple resource sheets. Um, one is on the various policies that schools have on visitors. Obviously, we're in a unique world because of COVID, and who knows how um, physical <laughs> we're going to be. My guess is there, there won't be many visitors allowed um, in the coming semester or two. Um, but, but we've still pulled it all together. So we have a resource sheet that, that goes through each of the school districts and talk with the contact information and talks about, do you need a background check um, and, and how to go through that process. I mean, as you know, off, most often, especially in elementary level and preschool level, teachers welcome parents coming into the classroom, whether it's to just walk in and say, help, what can I do for you today? Or I'd like to come in and talk about this particular holiday. So doing that kind of thing at the beginning of the school year, making sure that, that you um, have gone through whatever your school district's procedures are is a, a good thing to check off the list. Um, so, I, I, we also have a, a resource sheet, thank you to PJ and our partnership with PJ Library of um, books that are appropriate. So how would you use a book? And here's where, um, awesome. So here's a short list of, of books that um, talk about Rosh Hashanah um, that might be good to read to the class. That's one of the easiest things you can do. Um, I always, my kids always wanted to be very active in the presentation. So either having them sit with me while I read or doing some of the presentation was also a really great way to sort of empower them and boost their Jewish pride and get them excited to talk about a Jewish holiday with their non-Jewish friends and teacher. Um, okay, so we've talked about the calendar and proactive reaching out. Um, and so now I'm just going to share, well, I could pause right there and ask if you have any questions. Okay, so I'm just going to share sort of a mock presentation of what I do. And I have been doing this since my kids were in kindergarten. I know yours are a little bit younger. And there's usually a conversation with a teacher or an administrator who's going to say, really, you're going to, you're going to talk about what? And we have, you know, there's a separation of church and state and we can't teach religion. And you would say, of course not, absolutely not. We are huge, strong proponents that religion should not be taught in public schools, absolutely. Um, but there are standards, there are state standards that um, not only require, but allow teachers to recognize and talk about religion and talk about religious diversity. 
Um, and that's one of the most wonderful things about this country. And that's usually how I start my talk. Um, I'll sit on the floor with the kids. I don't try, try not to come off as a teacher. And I might ask people to raise their hand, ask kids to raise their hand. So if I'm talking about Rosh Hashanah, and I'm going to say those are Hebrew words. And here's what it means, head of the new year. And it's a really special holiday. When else do we think about a new year? And kids, even pretty young kids will say, well, that's New Year's Eve. But, but it's September or maybe October. So how is it the beginning of a new year on a Jewish calendar? I don't go, obviously, into too much detail about a lunar calendar or um, things like that. But I'll say it's the beginning when we think about what happened in the last year and what's going to happen in the next year and how we want to think and act and behave and how are we growing up. And so, depend, and you know, kids love to raise their hands and they'll start throwing things out and you'll need to sort of tamp some of that down at times, but you can let the conversation sort of meander a little bit and talk about New Year's resolutions or um, thinking about saying sorry. I try to bring in this idea that it's actually 10 days. Rosh Hashanah is, is the beginning, but little Johnny is also going to be missing school in 10 days. And that's another very special holiday called Yom Kippur. And that's a day, especially during those 10 days, where we think about how we've been acting over the past year and how we want to act over the next year. And that's a time when we actually walk up to people and say, I'm sorry if I didn't act so well. I'm sorry if I wasn't very respectful, you know, and have you ever had to apologize, you know, and do you talk, you know, and so you can open it up for a little conversation there and making it a really accessible sort of idea. So then I will share um, that like all holidays, and I'll say, give me examples of other holidays, and they'll say Halloween or Fourth of July or Christmas, that there's food involved. And that's the same with Jewish holidays too. And if I'm really organized ahead of time, I will have cut up, and I absolutely have to do this ahead of time because you don't have time. You cut up, and I didn't do it for today, but you know, you've got your apples and your honey. Um, you talk to the teacher ahead of time and say, are there any allergies? I'm going to be bringing in food. Some may say there's just no food no matter what. And you can still bring in something like this. And you can explain, um, you know, who's been apple picking? Doesn't everybody love apple picking in the fall? And isn't it, you know, great to have something sweet with it? Have you ever dipped an apple in honey? And if, you're, if the school allows you to bring in, and I usually take those little um, cups, the little... Um, uh, Dixie cups, and I'll put two apple slices and a little bit of honey. And my kids, and they maybe will get to pick a helper or two after they wash their hands, will squirt the honey into like 20 little Dixie cups. And then, you know, they do a little assembly line and they can eat their apples and honey. And for many, they've never thought to dip an apple in honey. So we talk about, we talk about the sweetness, we talk about um, apple picking, and that there's all sorts of foods. I'll say, what other foods can be made with apples and honey? And so they'll throw out ideas. And then one of the most exciting things to talk about, I bring in our shofar. And lots of Jewish families have a shofar. Many may not, but, um, but you can always borrow one or get one online or go to a synagogue gift shop and get them you know, where they might be a little bit smaller. So when I walk into a classroom with this, all the kids are looking at it, right? What is that? What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? Wait, what about that? And I will ask what they think it is. Does it look like anything they've ever seen? Probably no. I will even do something like this where I'll put it on top of my head and say, now what do you think it is? And they might say, oh my God, is that a horn? What animal would that come from? Oh my God, that's from an animal? You know, they get all excited. And I explain that it's open on one end and it makes a really loud noise and I will do an example. And I make sure the teacher knows. And I talk, 
to the kids to talk, you know, that this is going to be loud and it's really hard to blow. So you might not hear anything at first. So you have that conversation in advance and think about whether there are kids who have, you know, sound sensitivities or other classrooms nearby. And they'll just be like, what? You know, what have they heard? They've never heard a sound like this. So, and of course, I called it a shofar and I explained. And then I tell, I sort of say, so what? What do you think? Why would anybody need something like this? I mean, how would, let's think way back, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, even, when people, well, did people have cell phones? No. Did people have computers? No. Did people even have telephones? How would you tell people that it was time to come together for a holiday? How would you do it? You can't text somebody, right? You're not even going to ride the bike down the street to tell somebody. There might not even have been bicycles and streets. So how would you do it? So imagine if I was standing on top of a big hill and imagine it's a desert. And if I made this sound, do you think people would hear it? Yeah. So this was the call to make people know, to help people know that it was time to come together for a really big, important holiday. But it's also a sound that we hear even today when we go to our synagogue for the service. And if I haven't talked about what a synagogue is, I'll pause there and say, does anybody here go to a synagogue or a mosque or a temple or a church? Lots of hands will go up. And I'll explain that these are places that lots of people go, but not everybody. And that's okay too. Lots of people go to celebrate different holidays and to be with um, community. So we hear this shofar blast throughout Rosh Hashanah and even Yom Kippur. And it's such a loud sound, it's a, sort of supposed to shake us and wake us up to say, whoa, this is a, this is a big deal. Um, and of course, they're going to ask if they can blow a shofar. And I say yes. So how, now that we are in a COVID world, I don't know if this would ever even be possible again, but I would, and I have, I take in my wipes. Um, all the kids wash their hands. And we have them line up and I explain how to do it. And they've seen me wipe it down. I take the wipe out and I wipe and I do this. And then I take another wipe and I do this. And I even say they don't really have to put their lips up to it. And I have everybody practice. <laughs> and of course that's funny, right? Everybody's making this noise and it's not <laughs> and it's not <laughs> and it's not, <laughs> and it's not <laughs> you know, and some, that's a funny moment. So everybody practices, okay, is everybody doing it? You know, you point around the room and then I hold it and they walk up and get their face sort of close to it. Um, by that time, it's been, you know, and if every kid goes through and not everyone feels comfortable doing it, but we encourage them to, some want to do it more than once, you're cleaning it all along the way. Um, and then if there's time, sometimes that, that can take up the time, you know, maybe you're given 20 or 30 minutes in a classroom, um, but then there's reading a book. And that's also a way to sort of bring it back down and show that show a book that has universal messages. I mean, that's one of the best things about uh, on all the PJ Library books that I love so dearly and have on my bookshelf still. And if your kids have a relationship with one, you know, to say, this is, this is my kid's favorite Rosh Hashanah book. And you can even leave it in the classroom for a couple of days, you know, and let other kids come to it um, and read on their own or have the teacher read. Um, that um, does so much. Um, it, it gets all of these kids excited. They've just had an experience that they're going to tell their families about. It certainly didn't feel very religious, right? But it helps them understand, yeah, this is why Johnny's going to be out of 
school and did you get to play with that instrument? What that horn, what was it? I mean, the conversations I've heard my kids have over the years with their friends recognizing and the teachers love it. I've never had a teacher not say, thank you so much. This was incredible. I learned, they learn and they love it. And it, you only have to do it once before the teachers start talking. Excuse the noise in the back. Thank you to my husband for mowing. Um, you only have to do it once and then the teachers start talking to each other and the next year when you call, you say, oh yes, you did it last year. Oh, I'm so glad that you know your child is in our class so that we get to have this um, happen in our classroom too. Um, so it's, it's not rocket science, but, but for lots of parents, they might not feel comfortable doing it or might not realize how sort of accessible and, and easy it is. If you do some of the things at the beginning of the year, you plant the seed, you check out what the requirements are to come into your child's classroom, you talk to the teacher or to an administrator to say, this is who I am, this is kind of what the presentation's gonna be. 20 or 30 minutes, you can certainly adapt for Zoom. I mean, I did it. It's not nearly as much fun as kids being able to, you know, taste the apples and honey or try the shofar. Um, but, um, but when Robbie and I were talking a year ago and we're thinking over time, you know, when we see how kids in college are having to combat some anti-Israel, anti-Semitism. We say, okay, how can we help prepare them in college? Well, let's talk to them when they're in high school. Okay, in high school, they're still dealing with some pretty meaty stuff. Maybe we should think about middle school. Well, in middle school, we really need to be talking to them about how they can recognize anti-Semitism. What if they hear a Jewish joke? What are they supposed to do? Um, they're having a bar about mitzvah, maybe. That's cool, but you know, there's all sorts of stuff wrapped up in that. Let's get middle schoolers talking with each other. Well, what's appropriate for elementary age students and, and preschool students? And really, it's to be alongside a parent to start gaining some of those early skills and, and tools to just start articulating the fact that, hey, I'm Jewish, and I'm going to be out of school on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And my dad or my mom or my aunt or uncle is gonna come in and talk about it and I'm so excited. Um, and that sense of pride and ownership lays a foundation that I've certainly seen in my kids um, and I think um, would not just empower those kids but also parents. Parents who, who I will be on the phone with when their child has dealt with something because of the phone that they hold in their hand in middle school or, or worse in high school or college. And so this was, this was one, one way that we thought that um, it's a win, win, win all the way around for the kids, for the teacher, for the parent, for the Jewish kids. Um, and if more and more parents out there were willing to do this, um, it would help. Stem, stem the tide of, of anti-Semitism because all sorts of non-Jewish kids will be exposed to, to a little bit. And that's one of the biggest ways we at the JCRC feel like we can combat anti-Semitism. We build relationships in the Muslim community and black community and LGBTQ community and Latinx community. And I do that as a professional, but really it's, it's all of us have to think about how we want to have a Jewish conversation with somebody who's not Jewish. And the more our kids get used to that at an early age, uh, the more equipped and confident they'll be to do it in middle and high school and beyond. Yeah, and, I, I, I think that would definitely be something um, I could I could do fairly easily. Um, I mean, right now they're a little too young, um, but in, in a couple of years when uh, the kids, uh, are more focused on things uh, and events like that. That would yeah. be something I could do pretty easily. So, um, and I uh, love being in classrooms. I started out as a teacher, so I think I think um, yeah, pretty easy thing to do. Wonderful. So, 
Uh, Ravi, do you have any wrap up thoughts? Is there anything we haven't shared? I want to share something that feels really far in the future to you, Deanna, I'm sure because your kids are young, but with the middle school and high school, there will be times when um, things will come up in the curriculum, like they teach with mo more, more so middle school and definitely high school, where there'll be things in the curriculum that apply to be, like they talk, start teaching the Holocaust during, during middle school, and it's typically done through um, the English and then through social studies and they teach other things. And so it's great to give the kids a little bit of that language. Um, I only went into the classroom once when my younger daughter was in elementary school and it was a lot of fun and the teacher let me read a book and kind of similar to Lindsay's experience. It was also very fun for the other Jewish kids that happened to be in her class. My kids are also, we're also in Carmel. Um, and, um, some classes, my daughters have had no Jewish kids in their classes, and sometimes they've had a couple. It just always depends. But it was cute when it was also her friends, and they were super pumped to hear me, see me in there, and to be able to, for them, it was also nice to reflect on their own experiences, so that was fun. But it'll pop up as they get later in different places that I didn't always expect as the kids get older, so it's always good. And it's I'm so glad you brought that up, Margo. Um, you know, the, the curriculum does require, state standards do require, and it is starting in seventh grade, the, the teaching about world religions. And then there are other places where Holocaust or Jewish history or the Middle East do come up. And so as a parent, um, paying close attention, and we also have a, a, a resource list of the different uh, grades. So when to sort of pay attention and say, I wonder if this is the grade, this is the year that my child's going to be in a social studies class where they're going to be covering this, to, to look at what your kids are bringing home. Um, we offer a teacher training. Um, we've just actually completed um, a session where we um, teach teachers how to teach about religion, um, about anti-Semitism and about um, Israel and the Arab-Israeli conflict and peace process. And just as a teacher of a first grader says, thank you, this was really interesting. I learned so much. I know my kids did, but I learned also. Um, teachers of middle and high school um, grades say the same thing after the training like that. So um, paying attention to what your kids are bringing home um, is important. And if you ever have a question, if something is ever questionable, you are always welcome to reach out to the JCRC to go over something at the, you know, if there's a conflict, of course, if an absence isn't excused around a holiday, of course, um, and if materials are coming home that um, are questionable, please reach out to us. I, I, I taught high school out in uh, California, so it was uh, ninth grade. We had World Lit um, that I would teach uh, a bit about the Holocaust to the kids, so we would integrate different novels um, then. But um, I'd be really interested, in, I don't know if it's possible um, or if you guys are going to be doing it anytime soon again, but I would love to sit in on a session where you're teaching uh, the teachers how to teach about anti-Semitism, um, because I... Um, I mean, it, it sounds like it should be intuitive, but sometimes it's not, and it's really hard to talk about it. So I, um, do you have anything where maybe it's open to the public that um, we could sit in and, and learn about how to, how to do that? that? You know, that's a great question. And we actually just, we're having this conversation, which is, you know, the, the first session of this three-part series was, you know, how to um, support your child as they might experience anti-Semitism in middle school. And we, I, have, I have the recording, so I'm watching. You know. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and we recognize that th this kind of training or talking isn't just for the kids. It's as much for the parents. Sure. Um, because we're people too, and we are interacting with the world around us too. And so hearing you ask if, if you could sort of um, sit in on one of the teacher trainings, um, I'm not sure if it would be a, an actual teacher training because we'd really only do those once a year, but we could absolutely come up with a way. And we have, I mean, we did a symposium on anti-Semitism and brought in speakers. You know,
know, um, just because it's happening more and more and happening around us doesn't mean we all have degrees in Jewish history, you know, or Holocaust education. Um, as members of the Jewish community, um, it's good to stop and, and do a little bit of a deep dive for a minute into, you know, what is anti-Semitism? How should I be talking about it to people who aren't Jewish, who might yeah. not see it or feel it the same way I do? So I think it's a great suggestion and it's I'm, no doubt that it's something that we'll think about how we can make happen. Okay. Great. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the books and resources and way that you can find things to, uh, to present to the class through PJ Library. Um, that's a very short list of books that I, um, I chose from my collection in my office that I thought had a, a simple explanation of, of Rosh Hashanah and the kids, you know, it would, it would be a way you could read the book and people would understand, except for the Baxter book that's on the list, uh, Baxter, the pig who wanted to be kosher. That's just a very good book about acceptance and Judaism. And I thought it was, it pertains a lot to what's going on since today. So I put it on the list. Um, but um, PJ has books for every holiday, every uh, Jewish topic you can imagine. I have tons in my office that I'm willing to lend out or give out. Um, you could also look in any of the temple libraries. I know that they, most of them um, accept donations of the PJ books, and so they have lots of them that you could, that you could borrow. Also, um, going to the PJ Library website if you needed information about a, a craft that you could do for a particular holiday or theme. Um, I know that's something that the younger kids, especially in preschool, they the teachers they in my experience have always welcomed that. You know, it, it takes up a little more more time and it helps tie it in for the kids. Um, so you could find that on the PJ website or you could ask, ask me and I could help you find something. Um, but don't hesitate, like with JCRC, so don't hesitate to reach out to uh, PJ Library if you have any questions about resources. All um, right. We... I, I think we've covered most. I am um, really appreciative of this partnership with um, JCRC and PJ Library and the engagement team out of the Jewish Federation. Um, I know sometimes the audiences are small, but the videos are watched. And so if you are watching this, thank you. Um, go to um, our website, the Federation's website. You can look for the materials that we talked about that will be posted. You can also always email um, any of us and we'll share that when we post the link to the recording from today's conversation. I'm so glad you joined us, Deanna. Um, 